The Ancestral Trail, Book 7, Zock, Cannibal Chief. First published by Marshall Cavendish, 1993. Based on a story by Frank Graves. The rough surface of the stalagmite cut into Richard's back. He squirmed uncomfortably against the ropes which held the three companions bound to the pillar in the dimly lit cave. The voices grew closer. Then a thick set dwarf stepped out of the gloom. Ha! Ah, they're awake! The odd looking creature scoffed as a crowd of smaller dwarfs pushed and jostled behind him to get a closer look at the three captives. I am Locke, the dwarf said, and you are my prisoners. Richard gasped in dismay as Zock scuttled forward, aiming Jurut's dagger straight at his chest. Instead of the expected blow, though, Richard felt the blade cut through the ropes that held them bound to the stalagmite. Bring them to the brood hall, Zock ordered. Richard, Orkan and Melek found themselves surrounded by grinning dwarves, clasping stone knives and heavy wooden clubs. Richard noticed that some of the dwarves were carrying Orkan's weapons, making boastful swipes with his sword as they passed it around. The three stumbled on through a maze of caves and narrow tunnels, losing all sense of direction. Ahead of them, Zok swaggered through his realm with utter assurance. Every now and then, he shouted back at his followers to hurry. They, in turn, closed in to jab their captives with knives and force them into a jog. Do you know who they are? Richard muttered quietly to his companions. These are my people, Melek said in a low-pitched voice. But now they are under the control of the evil one. I heard that they have become cannibals. So why haven't they eaten us yet? Orcat asked quietly. Where are they taking us? Uh, to the pot, I suppose said Melek in a frightened voice. Further talk was cut off as the dwarves hustled their uncooked meal into yet another tunnel. Zok urged them on even faster until the trio finally emerged in a vast domed cavern. They were astonished at the scene which greeted them. In pride of place stood a tall wooden totem pole adorned with carved faces whose expressions conveyed both glee and horrible savagery. Richard noticed that the carved pole was held in great respect. When a dwarf came near it, he placed one hand on his belly and brought the other across his chest to his shoulder in salute. Around the edge of the cavern were dark openings, each with a bubbling cauldron and a cage at its entrance. Richard was horrified to see that some of the cauldrons were boiling at full blast with half-cooked limbs dancing lifelessly to the fire's command, First a head, its flesh loosening from the skull, floated to the surface, then an arm, firm yet tender, and a leg boiled to a juicy brown joint. At last Richard recognised the smell he had detected earlier when tied to the stalagmite. It was not the smell of cooking, but that of freshly slaughtered meat, rank and salty. His stomach tightened in automatic revulsion, and with horror, Richard realised they were being dragged to an empty cage by the totem pole where a huge pot simmered hungrily nearby. Willing hands thrust the three into the cage and slammed the door. The trio felt the cage lift off the floor and watched helpless as their weapons were placed on a nearby boulder. Zok gave an ugly leer and, summoning a group of his henchmen, he stomped out of the brood hall. Orkan rattled the door, but it was firmly locked. The bars were made of some tough wood, rigid as iron and bound in a narrow lattice by rock-hard strips of rawhide. Well, what do we do now? Orkan asked. Oh, we're lucky they didn't take the Book of Prophecies when they disarmed us, Melek said, sifting through the pages. I I'll see if it's any help. <coughs> 
Captives bound, caged underground, release is found in length around. A magic beam by evil seen, enemies will rise from below, and dark waters carry the foe. A prisoner's plight beyond the stern, now the slithering monsters turn, a new deep opens ere the burn. Melek read the riddle out in a low voice. Well, the first line is clear even to me, he said as he closed the book. In response, Orkan just slumped to the floor. Richard thought for a moment, then pointed to the rope looped around Melek's waist. That's our way out, Richard exclaimed. Escape is found in length around. It must mean Melek's rope. It's not a rope we need, it's our weapons, Orkan said in exasperation, staring at his sword and bow on the boulder just below the cage. Of course, Richard said, and the rope will get them for us. We'll make a slip knot and haul them in. That's not a bad idea, Orkan said, taking the rope from Melek. With astonishing speed, he fashioned an easy running slip knot. Here, let me do it, Melek said, taking the looped end of the rope and lobbing it underhand towards their weapons. As if by magic, the open loop landed perfectly around the hilt of Orkan's sword. Melek gave a sharp tug and the rope tightened around its target. He pulled gently until the sword teetered on its point and then swung off the boulder. As Melek hauled it upwards, Orkan reached through the bars for the pommel and pulled the weapon into the cage. What else have we got? Orkan said. Richard felt a shudder run through his body. Where was the pod? Had they taken his bag as well as Jurut's dagger? He felt under his tunic and was relieved to find the bag and the pod were still there. Richard rooted around inside his bag. My torch! he whispered in surprise. Richard had forgotten all about the small flashlight. He clicked it on and off. The batteries still worked. What's that? Melek asked, surprised by the strange light. We've got one chance, Richard said, ignoring the question completely. He brought the others into a huddle and outlined his plan. Meanwhile, in a nearby cave, Zok and his men were arguing about Richard and whether or not they should eat him. They recognised Orkan and Melek as creatures from their own world, but the boy was something new and strange. Zok was all for putting him in the pot, but the others, afraid of the unknown, protested that it might bring bad luck. Light! Zok raised his hand in final decision. We eat two now and leave the odd one for later. He led his kinsmen back to the brood hall. As he approached the cage, the frantic pounding of drums filled the air. You! Zok pointed at Richard. Stay there! You two, come out! Now! One of the dwarves leapt nimbly onto the bars and opened the cage door. He grinned and grabbed Melek's arm. Quick as lightning, Orkan's sword came to rest at the dwarf's throat. While Orkan disarmed him, Richard pulled his arms back and tied the rope around his wrists. It was all over in seconds. For a moment, Zok was taken aback, but he quickly recovered his composure. <laughs> what now? he mocked. You can't play that trick twice. Get them, he shouted to his men. Just then, Richard shone his torch full in Zok's face. The chief reared back, dropping Jarut's dagger. To Zok and his men, the light appeared to be coming from Richard's hand. It's magic, they're sorcerers, Zok cried. For the first time, a note of fear came into his voice. Run, he bellowed as he led his men out of the hall. For a while, Richard, Melek and Orkan stared in surprised delight. And then the three jumped from the cage, dragging their terrified captive with them. Stopping only to grab their weapons, they ran into a brightly lit tunnel. It was wide and straight, with an earth floor that had been beaten smooth by countless feet. Flaming torches sputtered along the walls, giving off an oily, sweet-smelling smoke. 
a faint rumour of drums drifted through the air as they hurried along. As if responding to a coded signal, their prisoner began to struggle. Richard shone the torch squarely into the dwarf's crumpled face, and the prisoner stopped squirming. Richard was trying to think about a course of action, when his eye was drawn to an opening on their left. As he squinted to see in the darkness, he sensed Golan calling him from inside. Down there, Richard cried to the others. As they turned into the tunnel, the steady beat of drums rose higher and higher. Zok was coming for vengeance. The walls of the tunnel were damp and slimy. Rusty stains were exposed iron deposits streaked from the rock, but the air was cool and fresh. I think we're getting near water, Orkan suggested. Then, rounding a corner, they came upon a vast lake. Before them, hauled halfway up the rocks, were a number of rafts and boats. Let's take one, Richard said, heading for a boat big enough to take them and their prisoner. What about the monsters in the riddle? Melek queried. They could be out there. That's right, Richard said, but we don't have a choice. Zok will be on us any minute. Wait, Orkan broke in. You'd better push off those other boats. But before Richard could unfasten the slimy ropes, he heard angry shouts and the pounding of many feet coming down the tunnel. Orkan and the prisoner were already in the boat. With Melek's help, Richard pushed it onto the lake. As the first water lapped over their shoes, they jumped into the stern. The craft wobbled uncertainly, but settled onto an even keel. Richard and Melek each took an oar and began to row as hard as they could. We should have scuttled those boats, Orkan muttered. Zok can still chase us. There was no time, Richard puffed. Yeah! The prisoner spat at Richard, his courage returning at the thought of being rescued. You'll never get away. Zuck will catch you. The dwarf's words sent a chill down their spines. Melek and Richard increased their efforts, putting all their strength into rowing, straining hard against the rollocks. They were a good distance from the shore when their small boat came to a sudden stop. What is it? Richard asked. I don't know, Orkan replied from the bow. I can't see anything. Hand me your torch. Richard passed over the torch, and Orkan shone its beam over the lake. I can't see anything, he said. Try rowing harder. Richard and Melek hauled desperately at their oars. The boat slid forward a fraction and stopped again. Wait, Orkan cried. I think I saw something move. As Orkan shone the torch down into the water... A narrow set of jaws rose out of the darkness and fastened onto his arm. Orkan jumped back just in time, losing only a shred of his sleeve. In the beam of the torchlight, they could see a mass of squirming grey eels. Each one was as thick as a man's thigh, and each one ended in a vicious, sharp-toothed snout. As they stared wide-eyed into the teeming waters, Zok's men appeared across the lake and boarded the boats and rafts. Zok was coming towards them in a shallow boat illuminated at either end by flickering candles held by shiny skulls. As the dwarves came closer, a hoarse bellow of triumph echoed from the lake's surface to the roof high above. Orkan moved fast. He grabbed their prisoner and with one supple movement raised the dwarf above his head and before Richard or Melek could say a word, Orkan had flung the dwarf into the water. Zok's boat was only a short distance away, and in the light of the burning candles, both groups could see the eels surge backwards towards the dwarf. Now the slithering monster's turn, Orkan grinned, quoting from the riddle. Let's go! Its course now free, the boat leapt forwards as Richard and Orkan grabbed the oars and started pulling. Before long, they were well ahead of Zok's warriors, who were blocked by the eels. They splashed noisily across the lake, caution thrown to the wind, until they hit the opposite bank. Hurry, Orkan said, jumping out of the boat to heave it ashore. Looking back, Richard saw a smoky red glow where Zok was battling his way through the eels. Then he shone the torch into the forbidding darkness ahead and saw a tunnel leading off of the lake. Orkan led the way through the narrow passage. 
The light was weak and shadowy, and the ground underfoot was smooth. They made good time until Orkan came to a halt. The path suddenly stopped, leaving the tunnel split in two by a wide gap. As they peered into its depths, they could see no bottom to the precipice. They could go no further. Richard put his head in his hands and groaned.